Well, it's great to see everybody. So, since uh, this is the last one, um, I've got the rest of the year, so get comfortable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it might take a while. I have, however, had lots of help with this last sermon. I don't know where you guys were before, but for some reason, I have lots of people telling me what, they should, what I should say. One of the most obvious ones, or the ones that I get the most suggestions are, is that uh, you ought to blast them. <laughs> okay. And what does that mean? Well, that means you're going to say everything, every frustration, everything bad that you know, and, and you ought to blast them. And they seem really excited about it. <laughs> I'm not, I think they weren't including themselves in one of the things. And uh, so I, I finally said, well, I've been doing that for the last 12 years. What do you think? <laughs> I don't really have any other things to blast them with. I mean, if they haven't been listening by now, it's not going to make any difference. So that's just one of those things that's the way it is, and trying to look at how things work and, and what you're going to do. Uh, we're going to be talking about Joshua today and about some of the things there. My son also said, well, I was told him I was going to do Strong and Courageous. It's, he's preaching in Jacksonville, Florida right now, and so it's a great thing to get to watch him. So now he gives me son advice. <laughs> it's not fatherly advice, it's son advice. So he said, well, you've got the wrong title for your last sermon. He said, here's what his title should be. Seems appropriate that we could do that, but uh, I've learned not to listen to him either. <laughs> the same way he may not have listened to me, so we're going to stick with Joshua and look at some of the things that Joshua talks about today, and uh, I, I like this passage just because of where those people are, and I think we find ourselves there a lot of times. This is God's word to Joshua. God said he would be with him. I will never forsake you. What an incredible statement that is, that you have a God that is always with you and will never forsake you. God's promise is huge. That is so amazing when we realize that because we realize there's a whole lot of other people that have let us down in the past. People have said that they would do something, and they don't, or something else happens, and, and we've done that with other people as well. We've let them down, and some things just don't go well. But to have a God who is always there and always going to be there, that is so huge. So he tells him, I want you to be strong and courageous because I am always going to be here. You're going to cause people to inherit the land. You're going to bring them into this new land. And so do everything that the law says. I want you to meditate on it. You will have good success. Uh, you will make your way prosperous. Don't ever be frightened or dismayed. What a great thing it is that God is telling him here. This is intentional discipleship. It's what it really is. It's what we do today with Jesus, is we are to be strong and courageous. And so, I'm telling you for the last time, <laughs> you need to be strong and courageous. It is what we are to do in the face of all the things that are going on. There will be things that we are to do now. That's what this whole thing is about, is that this is not the end. This is not where you just sit back. It does presume there is more work to be done. Otherwise, why would you be strong and courageous? There is a whole land to conquer, and Joshua goes in, and there are things that we will fight as well. There are battles that we will have. 
And so there is more things to do in service to God. And that is really what's most important. Their battles looked intense to them and our battles look intense to us. They looked at their enemy and they were giants and they looked at themselves and they were grasshoppers and they, they could not grasp how it would ever work. But that's really what it is about is that we just put ourselves in God's way. We buy into God's dream and he does all of that. He is the one who makes all the difference. Moses tried to get out of it when God first told him I want you to go lead the people. Well, I'm, I, I'm not good enough. I don't speak well. I can't say things. What if they don't believe me? And that didn't work out very well for him. He went anyway. The people tried to get out of it. They grumbled and complained. Oh, there's no water out here. There's no food out here. We don't even like the food that you're giving to us. And... So they tried successfully to get out of it, but I'm not sure that's really good because it didn't turn out the way they wanted. They all died along the way. So what I'm trying to tell you, if you don't do what God wants, it is not healthy. The best thing that you can do for your life is to do what God wants of your life and then blessings come. And he does so many good things. It isn't just a promised land that they were going to. And I want you to realize that that's not all it was about. They were building people of faith. That's really what they were there to do, is to build this whole nation of faith when they had been so far down. I mean, the contrast is huge to go from being slaves completely unable to stand on their own now to being a people that goes in with power as people of faith. What an incredible thing that was. But we realize as we look at this that, that you know, this happened with Joshua, but it was God that did it. And by the time you get to the end of the book of Joshua, it's one of the most impressive stories you'll ever read. It says in Joshua 24, 31, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and all who had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. Wow. That's huge. That all of the people, all of the time, they all were faithful to God. You see, their history had not been good. They had come out of faithless people. Their parents did not teach them how to love God. They had lost 99.99999% of all the adults that had left Egypt. That's not a good track record. And yet, at the same time, they get to the edge of the land of promise. And he says, be strong and courageous. They needed a leader who could do that first. They had come out of dismal failure to be able to say, we need parents, we need leaders who are able to do this. Almost every leader had let them down. Does that sound vaguely familiar? And yet out of the fact that they had parents who did not teach them, and out of the fact that they had leaders who had failed them, they built a faithful nation of people who would serve God. What an incredible thing that is. Do we believe that's possible? You see, they are people of faith from faithless parents. So be strong and courageous. And yet, most of the time, it looks kind of like this. We look at ourselves and we go, well, I don't know about this. And so are we parents raising children to be people of faith? So I'm telling you for the last time, your kids are important. Your kids are something that you have to do for God. 
And it is so extremely critical that he wants them to be people of faith. We are trying to build that, that nation, that people that is able to serve God, that is able to do things. And so we need to raise our children well. The story goes, and we can read it over and over in the Bible. It says, and they did not know God, and they did not follow God. And there's usually bad things at the end of that story. Or it says, they returned and they came to God and they believed and they reformed a kingdom. And there are always good things that happen at the end of that story. Which story do you want to be part of? I'd rather be part of the good one. And so what kind of generation are we raising? We can't raise them to go either way, but the final choice is theirs. It's not ours. And they may completely go against everything that you taught them, but you taught them, and you were there to be able to be an influence for God. God's promise is still there. It's still real. There is something greater to accomplish. Or there is something very simple to accomplish that it's almost unnoticeable and yet it changes everything. And God works from both sides of that. And so first, we need to work with other people. It is the fastest way to build relationships. People who say, I don't know anybody I'm not doing anything, I don't know, nobody calls me, tells me you're not involved. Sign up for something, stick in, do something. That's what makes all the difference. It's important. We need to follow God's word. God's word is real. God said it, it's important, not just the summary, because a lot of times we're getting just the summary today. We need to read his word and know that what he said is real. And if we follow his word, we are blessed. What an incredible thing that is. We also need to be people of faith. I saw this. True faith is not a leap in the dark. It's a leap into the light. And God is looking for people of faith. God is looking for places where he can send people. Danger is not our obstacle. We are the obstacle, so don't let danger scare you. Uh, it does look scary, but don't let it change what you do. We need to believe in impossible things. Put ourselves in the way of impossible things and watch how they work out because God is able to be there. It's important that we are able to follow this word of God. I was reading and I saw this one scripture and I thought this was really one of the best scriptures I had ever seen. For we know that if this tent that is our earthly home, we went, huh, wait a minute. This tent that is our earthly home. So I went home and I told Nancy, hey, I found this great scripture. It talks about a tent, this tent that is our earthly home. I can see maybe some fulfillment in some scripture that is uh, being presented here. And uh, it kind of talks about a heavenly home that we will be with our Father, but it also talks about an earthly tent here. And I can see maybe this is prophecy of... Uh, tent sitting under a Palo Verde tree when it's all in bloom and the sun's coming in and uh, I think we might be able to do that one and uh, but that's not why I started in 2 Corinthians 5 it's yeah sorry just a side note here 2 Corinthians 5 a little further down is also so we are always of good courage same as Joshua we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by, by faith, not by sight. 
Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. He says, we are of good courage. That's what he writes. And that's what I want you to know today. We are of good courage. It's important that we're able to do things. It's important that we're able to face things because the path is not always the easiest path. But it is something that we're able to do, and we are able to be of good courage wherever God takes us and wherever God leads us. It's one of the most important things, to walk by faith, not by what we can see or by what we're afraid of. And We need to do some invisible things. We don't see them right now, and yet that's really the fun, isn't it? To see what's going to happen, to put yourself out there, to be in front of things. I've learned to enjoy this, and I believe better things are coming. In case you're worried or nervous, I believe better things are coming. It's going to be a, a great thing. This is God at work. We don't know everything next, but we can see some great things coming. If you go back 12 years and you could say you are going to be sitting where you are now 12 years ago, would you have believed it? Would you have believed where the church would be? Would you have believed where your family would be? It's been 12 years, and it makes a huge difference. Why? Did you plan all that out? Well, there's been some amazing things that have happened that we didn't plan at all. So why would we stop with that now? What's going to happen in the next dozen years? How great is that going to be? And so we make it our goal to please him. We make it our goal because it is so amazing. And God is looking for people who please him. God is looking for people willing to do his word, willing to do it his way. He is looking for that from Israel as you read through the Bible and we can see their story and a lot of time they were not pleasing to God. He is looking for that in America, that we would be people who are pleasing to God, that we would follow what God says and we would make God important. He is looking for that in Mesa Church right here that we are people of God, the people who are the ones who please him. One of the most important things that we do to please him is worship. That's why we're here today. And I'm so glad for all of you to be here today to be able to worship God as we come into his presence. One scripture that is most important is John 4. As we look at what Jesus says, he's talked to a woman about the Holy Spirit and she turns the conversation to worship because that's the thing we like to argue about the most. We do a great job at arguing about worship. We don't do such a good job at doing worship. And yet that's exactly what Jesus tells her. An hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. The Father is seeking people to worship him. And and we've answered that, right? God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And we, we can be consumed about what spirit and truth means or we can focus on the fact that God wants people to worship him. He's looking for people who will worship him. It's not that difficult. We usually have places that are open, you know, like on a Sunday morning, about 1030. And you can usually find a place to worship him. And so why should that be so hard? Why is God having to look so hard to find people who can worship him? Because that's just critical. And I appreciate all the people here for the worship that they do because they really share their heart. They really open up. And we are in his presence on Sunday when we want to honor him. 
And so God is seeking people to worship. Don't ever let that be mundane or uninteresting. It's important that we do it. I heard a story one time about a man who came to the preacher and said, well, you know, I, I'm just not getting anything out of it. Your sermons don't engage me. It's just not, not good. I don't know what to do. I want to worship God, but I just, I'm just not interested in anything. And, and it seems like, you know, it just goes on and on. And I, I would like to do that. And the preacher says, okay, I have the solution for you. And the guy says, okay, I'll try anything. What is that? He says, you start giving $1,000 a week. And the guy says, oh, no, no. He said, no, you said you would try anything. You start giving $1,000 a week. And the guy came back to him a couple, a couple months later and said, it's amazing how much better your sermons have gotten. <laughs> Anytime you invest a significant amount, it gets better. What an amazing thing that is. And that's what it takes is for you to invest a significant amount. And worship is incredible. It's really what we do. We've been focused on singing for the last few years. And so I've got some exciting things to announce. We have been trying to do this for the last couple years. Keith Lancaster does a workshop called Praise and Harmony Workshop, and he is going to be here the first weekend in November. And so we have been working on this for a couple years, um, I think three now, because the first year we had a hard time scheduling, and then last year, well, last year just almost didn't happen. So. This November, we have Keith Lancaster coming to do the Praise and Harmony workshop. And yet, in order to do that, he has a whole lot of songs because he is the singer and we are going to be learning some new songs. And I appreciate Tricia and Michael and Justin and Michael and Michael and Michael. We seem to have lots of Michaels around. Um, but we're going to start learning on new songs on Wednesday, and that will begin on June 16th. This will be the first opening of our Wednesday class, and the class is going to be on singing. We'll be here in the auditorium, so you can be very distant from other people if that's an issue for you. And so there will be lots of room to spread out, and so Tricia Ubrig and Michael Murphy will be here teaching songs and maybe some of the other people who are here who are able to help with that. It's a first step to be able to get back on Wednesdays and I know there's going to be more things that come on Wednesday. But that's a good way to start. It's a good way to learn how to praise. And if you say, well, my voice doesn't sound good. Mine doesn't either. But it sounds much better when Tricia helps. <laughs> so that makes a huge difference. Last scripture today. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. It's very simple. God puts them where he wants them. He places them and sometimes they fit very easily and sometimes they get a little bit squished. It talks about, you know, we have different parts. Some people are a hand, some people are a foot. Some people go from being a hand to being an armpit. But we're all important, right? I mean, we need all of the parts, and God has arranged all of the parts the way he wants. And so my part in the body will be changing. And sometimes God rearranges parts in the body. 
And so if you don't like where you've been, expand it. Make it different. Make it something incredible. Try something new for a while. You only have to do it for 12 years, okay? <laughs> After that, you can switch and go to something else. And, and so let me encourage you today to be able to find the place where you fit. And if you're not part of the body of Christ, I'm telling you for the last time, you need to be. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, you need to be baptized into Christ so that your sins can be taken away, so that you can get this Holy Spirit, so that you're able to be there and you need, if you need forgiveness, we're here to help. That's what we're doing. That's what we do all the time. It isn't because you haven't heard. So today's the day, all right? When we sing, today's the day. We can make all the plans we want to make. And then I saw this. If you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. <laughs> That's kind of where we are. So Nancy and I will be around just so we don't have to answer this question 300 more times. Uh, this is still home base for us. We are going to take a trip in July and August for a little bit, so we'll be back and forth, but this isn't goodbye because you're not getting rid of us. <laughs> it's the most frustrating thing to say goodbye and the person won't leave. <laughs> uh, so let's not say goodbye. Um, We'll be gone for a little bit. We aren't leaving, so that's the way it works. Faith in God includes. It includes faith in his time. So we'll be here for a few more weeks. I'll be working till the end of July, just not up here. It's going to be somebody else who's going. I think Doug is coming next week, and so that's going to be a good thing for you guys to learn. I know this will be my last sermon as a full-time regular minister. It's been over 47 years. April 17th was 47 years, and now it's more, and I'm sure I'll preach more uh, if, if I can find anybody to listen, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's been great being able to be here with you guys and getting to share scripture with you, because that's great. I've already talked to Greg. I'm going to have conversation with him. He is the one coming to be the interim guy. We have a phone conversation set up this week. We've emailed, and so it's going to be great. But it's time for God to rearrange the parts in his body. It's just time. So I have a new job. I'm taking the pew job now. And that's the way Nancy said it, that I think's the best. Is we're gonna be here and we'll see you in the pew. So let's praise God. Who was he?